I'm Julianne DeLynn Hatton, and you're listening to Faith and Reason on the Mormon Faircast. This series will discuss the Prophet Joseph Smith and the authenticity of the gospel he restored. I'll be speaking with Michael R. Ash, author of the book of Faith and Reason, 80 Evidences Supporting the Prophet Joseph Smith. Welcome, Michael Ash. Hi, Julianne. We're talking about King Benjamin's speech today. Yeah, um, one of my uh, favorite topics, at least from a spiritual level, and very fascinating from uh, an intellectual level as well. On both levels today, and I thought that was yeah. interesting. Let's begin by describing what is happening in Mosiah 118. Mosiah is the son of King Benjamin, and King Benjamin wants to talk to the people. He, he has very important words to share with them, and that's kind of what the uh, chapters build up to, and, and like I said, wonderful uh, talk there from King Benjamin. And he wants to address the people, so he has them all gathered together at the temple in the land of Zarahemla. And there's a ton of people that come out, and they, they pitch their tents. And it, it, this is kind of a side note, but uh, when we hear pitch tents, we think of going camping with you know the canvas or nylon tents, and, and that's not obviously what they would have had um, in their days. In fact, the Mesoamericans had apparently portable, I guess, huts almost, uh, you know, that they would bring the materials to assemble something. So it wouldn't have been a tent like we envision. But anyhow, the families would, would pitch these tents and came to the temple. But there was there was too many people, uh, and, and there was no way that King Benjamin was going to be able to address them, you know, all there uh, at the temple. And so he asked that a tower be constructed so he could climb up on the tower and, and uh, his voice would carry uh, a greater distance. And so this tower was constructed. And then again, when, when we envision a, a, a tower, we think of a tower, you know, maybe like Leaning Tower of Pisa or something that's, you know, a tall, uh, narrow construction. But uh, a tower could also refer to uh, something that was pyramid-shaped. In, in fact, the Spaniards, when they uh, saw the, the pyramids. They referred to them as towers, so it was some sort of high point. So again, this ties into what we know about the actual land in Mesoamerica. So anyhow, the, this this tower was built, and, and King Benjamin uh, went up to the tower and, and gave his speech, and then for the people that were still too far away or couldn't uh, hear his voice, his words were written down and then passed on so everybody could uh, partake of, of his very important message. This must have been a very important message. It was, yeah. King Benjamin shares a lot of uh, great things in his speech, and, and he was a very humble man, and he talks about being a servant to the people and how that, you know, if he is the king, is a servant, how, how we should all be servants um, to each other and, and really tries to unify the people and, and uh, get everybody on the same playing field that they are, are to serve each other and be be close and brothers and sisters and, and uh, you know, reject pride and have more humility. So it's words that were applicable to his people and definitely applicable to our times today as well. Almost like a Sermon on the Mount. Y yeah, yeah, very close to that, yep. Also, it was somewhat of a dangerous culture, so the fact that he was talking about a king being a servant and loving and serving one another and how we're nothing but dust. Yeah, exactly. You know, basically that uh, everything uh, belongs to our Heavenly Father. I mean, we're, we're kind of renting the stuff, and, and so, uh, you know, we're caretakers, I guess is the best way to describe it. And he basically points that out, is that, uh, you know, we, we're very lowly, but... You know, our, our Heavenly Father, in His kindness and lovingness, uh, you know, basically descends to us and, and uh, is even, a, I don't want to say a servant to us, but He serves us, but, you know, through His Son and, and, and uh, His entire work, of course, is to bring us up to His level, which is pretty uh, amazing just on its own. Which is accomplished by the Atonement. Exactly. What was it about this that fascinated you enough to put it in your book of Faith and Reason? Hugh Nibley was the intellectual, the LDS intellectual, that really kind of sparked me on trying to understand the scriptures from a, a point of view, from a scholarly point of view. And he had written that this entire uh, ceremony, this, this speech that King Benjamin gave, was reminiscent 
of what we find in antique patterns, ancient old world patterns, what he called the, the uh, National Assembly. It basically is a farewell address. In, in fact, he, uh, Dr. Nibley refers to the writings of a non-Mormon scholar by the name of William Kurz, who had published a detailed study about these uh, farewell addresses. And he and Dr. Kurz um, used the Bible as his source to break down these farewell addresses and, and uh, find these elements. And he found 20 elements. And he says, now, now, these 20 elements aren't present in all farewell addresses in the Bible, but there's big chunks of them. And he points out that Moses, for instance, had 16 of these elements. Uh, Paul had 14 of these elements as well, and points out several other ones. And uh, using that same criteria, Dr. Nibley was able to show that King Benjamin's speech contained at least 16 of these elements as well. Let's end with the Nibley quote. Yeah, talking about this entire thing, Nibley observes, quote, imagine a 23-year-old backwoodsman, referring to Joseph Smith, of course, in 1829, giving his version of what an ancient coronation ceremony would be like. What would be done and said, how and by whom? Put the question to any college senior or dean of humanities today and see what you get. And I think that's a, a great way of putting it because how many people um, are knowledgeable enough, even with the education that's available today, to be able to recreate this? And here, Joseph Smith was able to do it. I think it's a strong evidence that he didn't invent this, that he was simply translating what was written on the plates. One of the strongest you mentioned in the book. Yes, I think it's, it's a very strong confirming evidence for the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. Thank you, Michael Ash. Thank you, Julianne. Thanks for listening to Faith and Reason on the Mormon Faircast. I'm your host, Julianne Delin Hatton, inviting you to keep the faith. Michael R. Ash is the author of the book, Shaken Faith Syndrome, Strengthening One's Testimony in the Face of Criticism and Doubt, as well as the book of Faith and Reason, 80 Evidences Supporting the Prophet Joseph Smith. Faith and Reason is produced by Tom Hatton with music courtesy of Arthur Hatton. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You can support this podcast by subscribing to it in iTunes and by rating it and writing a review. Questions or comments can be sent to podcast at fairmormon.org or you may join the conversation at fairblog.org.